Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, which we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about anything we feel like when it comes to the Beatles. Could be any part of their past, what's going on today, and possibly what's going on in the future. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my other Beatles syndicated show called Every Little Thing. Being joined by my three other regular co-hosts. First of all, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, the number one leading Beatles news source on the internet, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have one of the writers, longtime writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And another writer for Beatle Fan and lots of other music publications. Many years he spent with the New York Times writing for their classical department, and he's written for a lot of other uh, music publications, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. How's it going? Hello, everyone. On today's show, we've got a whole bunch of topics to talk about. There's a lot of things going on in the news, and a lot of it concerns Paul McCartney, and we're going to start our conversation by talking about the beginning of his new tour, which is called the one-on-one tour, the first date of which began in Fresno, California, at the Save Mart Center. And our very own Steve Marinucci, our man on the scene, (laughs) was there at the concert. So we're going to be asking him questions about it, what it was like, and also some other news about Paul related to the tour. And also, I guess we'll talk about the set list, too. But, Steve, first of all, general question, how did the concert go and what was the audience response to it all? Well, the, it was a small hall. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, huge, uh, it wasn't a huge place. It was uh, 16,000. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, it, it, yeah, it was it was relative. I wouldn't say intimate, but I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like seeing him at Madison Square Garden or you know some huge uh, you know multiplex or a football field or something. But it was it was a it was a very nice atmosphere, uh, and the crowd was the crowd was very enthusiastic, extremely enthusiastic. They were. Uh, Paul had never played Fresno before. I, I, in fact, you know, I kept wondering as I was driving. It's a three-hour drive from where I live, and I uh, kept wondering. I mean, it's really out in farm country. It's you know, and I really kept wondering what Paul was doing out here, you know. <laughs> but it was. I mean, it was. It was a nice. I mean, I got in the day of the concert. I think I got it. In, got into town maybe about four or five hours before the concert, um, and. Um, it was, you know, it's a ni- it's a nice town. It's quiet, kind of quiet, um, except for the concert, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it was uh, what well, one surprising thing. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of. Um, I think Candlestick was a lot more. How much did we pay to park at Candlestick, Ken? Do you remember? Oh, uh, I thought it was probably about twenty to thirty bucks. Yeah, it was only ten dollars in Fresno. Hmm. Okay. Which which I was surprised. I was quite surprised that it was so cheap because they could have basically charged anything and and they didn't. And so um, that was kind of interesting. You know, there a, a lot of people were there. A lot of people were dressed up for with you know with Beatles stuff and McCartney stuff. I saw a sergeant a guy in a Sergeant Pepper outfit. So I mean, the crowd was was rearing to go. And about uh, an hour before they started playing the music, a half hour before they started doing the, you know, the uh, the sound collage and everything like that, and the and the and the effects on the sides of the stage, and um, just about on time. I didn't notice exactly what time, but it was supposed to start at eight thirty. Just about on time, they started, mm-hmm. and the crowd and and the crowd really kicked it up a notch or quite a few notches at that point when paul walked out everybody was going crazy they were cheering and yelling and screaming and and uh when they when they opened up with a hard day's night i was kind of, i was surprised i was shocked it was wow you know um it didn't i i didn't bring any set list information with me so i didn't know that that was the first time he had played it until after i had gotten home but it was like wow really uh, you know i actually thought the the chord if you hear, hear the youtube 
version, the chord didn't sound as good as the Beatles chord. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, the song was the song was good. You know, the song. Was yeah, I was going to ask you that because it sounds sort of muffled on the YouTube, and it's hard to tell whether mm-hmm. it, it was anything like that live or or not. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it was. It was a little. It did seem a little muffled live, but. What can I say? Um, it was. I mean, it was. It was. It, it was nice to hear that. the new The new songs uh, were really. Well, there were only a couple of new songs, but I mean, the, the the new songs added to the set list were nice. The one that really got to me was. Um, I'm looking down the list here, and I, I can't. Oh, in spite of all the danger, that was the big surprise. And somebody told me I thought that was the first time, but somebody told me it wasn't the first time. No, he, he no. did it. He did it. Um, 2005, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, again, you know, I'm standing there in the show, and I didn't, I didn't know that, but uh, yeah. Um, and and the "Love Me Do" tribute to George Martin was very nice. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. the other thing that I really, really liked was the um, "My Valentine" with the black and white, uh, and and I, you know, that was really cool because he had the uh the two black and white videos on the stage and then on the sides of the stage you saw paul in black and white and the, even the on the the band was in black and white at that point so you couldn't nobody was in color it was it was a nice effect well, that wow. was really really nice mm. it was really nice um well, most of the other songs were you know were typical in that particular building because it wasn't that big Live and Let Die was very loud, mm. uh, very loud. I uh, I did not bring earplugs with me, but I had my I had my fingers over my ears at that point because I really was kind of nervous, and and it was you could hear how loud it was. Sure. Um, but uh, the show went off great. They sounded fantastic. They sounded well rested. I've heard bits and I mean that night. Paul's voice sounded great, although like maybe I'm amazed it sounded a little creaky. Mm. And there were a couple of other songs I didn't particularly care much for four or five seconds. Uh, trying to play that live um, just doesn't work for me. I mean, that's just my personal feeling, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Did he do the Did he do the full song? Because when I've heard yes. him in the past. He usually did about maybe a minute and a half to two minutes of it. It I wasn't the did, full song. I thought he did most of the song. I mean, he, uh, there was no there was no cussing in it or anything. But I thought it was much song. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 that just didn't work for me. I mean, at the end of the show was you know everything he's done before. I mean, he did you know Mr. Kite something, USSR. You know, I mean, there wasn't really any. And he uh, he did flub the words to yesterday, and and he kind of he he raised his eyebrows a little bit, and then said, uh, you know, I think he said something like, uh, or he or he, or he did so, uh, he raised his eyebrows and kind of went, oh well, but uh, I mean it was it was I mean the show was great. I mean I I have to say that you know I mean when you see the show live, you know even if his voice isn't excellent, which in some in a couple of spots it wasn't. I mean, you know, it's still it was still a great show. The band sounds great, of course. There was one point where Wix was. I remember now that Wix was looking over to the side of the stage, and I can't remember why he was smile. He was smiling or something. I don't. I I couldn't figure out what that was all about. But uh, Abe Abe was great. There was one point, and I'm I, and I don't want to. Boy, I don't want to suggest anything that I that that. Uh, the drums didn't match up with what I was seeing on the video screen, and I don't know what that meant. Whether it was in my, you know, whether it was echo or what, I don't know. But I, I don't know. But in any event, I thought it was a great show. I mean, I, it, there's a, there's a, there are some different effects. There are, you know, the the usual light shows there. You know, everything. Uh, he did high, high, high that night, which I really, which I was really glad to hear because I like that song. Well, he's so, been doing that since the last tour. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I think the last time I saw him, uh, he didn't do it. So, but no, it was. I mean, it's it's a it's a great show. I mean, uh, you know, it, it sounded good. I'm just uh, shocked after adding after he added uh, DC this morning. 
how just how long this thing is going to go and if he's going to last. Good God! I mean, it's already what thirty two. I think it's thirty two shows already. Um, well, of co- well, of course they're spread out over. You know, if you notice, there's no there are no two nights in a row <laughs> because well, his voice his voice just doesn't mm. you know can't take it. Actually, there is tonight. Tonight, tomorrow, or two nights in a row. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Uh, I remember, so, Steve, not long ago when when the first dates were announced in the U.S., and then we heard about the European ones, and you said you really doubt that he's going to do any more U.S. shows. And as soon as I heard about the St. Louis show, yeah, which, if, if, if you notice, it follows the European shows. Mm-hmm. You know, you knew right then and there he was going to add more U.S. shows. Well, the the, Saint, the Cincinnati show is the first you or no, I'm sorry, the because I'm looking at the at the uh, the list now. Since uh, Milwaukee is the first new show after Europe, um, but they're but they also they're taking a lot of breaks too. I mean, after yeah uh, tonight, they have a ten day break between now mm-hmm. and, and Little Rock. So uh, you know they're they're going to be you know they, they've got enough breaks to you know they've planned it. It's not a it's not a killer uh, schedule in terms of one show after the other, but it's already gone into August, and that's pretty uh, pretty interesting. And, and you know how how long he'll go, and whether he'll go anywhere else besides Europe. Um, he's got he's got a a charity show in London. I I I heard a rumor about Liverpool, mm. um, but. Um, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, we'll see where it goes from there. And like I wrote um, on my stories, if you're going to get souvenirs, especially and especially if you want a program, get it early. They ran out the first night, and I, I mean, I went to all the souvenir stands, and they were gone. They were all gone. Mm-hmm. And which they didn't run out of shirts. I mean, forty dollars shirts are hard to get rid of, um, but uh, <laughs> thirty dollar programs weren't as weren't as easy and there were uh if you look around or at least there were in fresno there were uh quote unquote unauthorized shirts out there sure Hmm. you want to say something else yeah uh bob gannon who has probably seen more mccartney concerts than anybody in the world yeah uh other than you know paul's own people um said that uh that uh paul's voice was shaky quite a bit in fresno on that first night i don't think it was that shaky i mean it there were like i said there were uh, there were a couple of spots um um you know maybe i'm amazed it was very noticeable maybe it's just because you know being there and hearing all the cheering you don't notice it that much you know you're Mm. you're too into the show Mm. but i mean there there were no, there's no doubt there were some spots where his voice was was a little shaky. Uh, I, the couple of things I've heard from the shows after seemed to be a little shakier than that. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't know. You know, plus I, there's there's so much sound that could hit you at once mm-hmm. when you yeah. go to these shows, and you also have the band harmonizing with them at times, and you don't know if they're adding echo. So all that, it, it makes it difficult to just single out Paul's voice very often. Right. Mm. right. Yeah. Uh, he, he brought back Here, There, and Everywhere mm-hmm. for the first time in quite some time. I guess since, what, 2005? 2000, I think uh, so. Two, 2006. I think so. 2006. Yeah. 2006. And uh, that would, I think that would be a test mm-hmm. because, you know, of how strong his voice is. Yeah, my friend, my friend Keith, who went with me, um, we we had a suggestion for Paul that he should try "She Loves You." Um, I don't know that that will ever happen, but we can cross our fingers. And the other one, of course, that I would love to see that will never happen in the U.S. is Mullet Kintyre. <laughs> but you know, mm. oh well, Paul, if you're listening, Mullet Kintyre, please. Hey, I'd like well, to see know, him what? do "I Want to Hold Your Hand." I mean, it was such a big song for them; he's never done it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, right. you know, he's he's pulled out surprises. <clears throat> yep. You know, songs that he didn't do lead vocals on. Mm-hmm. Like I... "Please Please Me," he did back in uh, you know the mid two thousands. Yep. And I... um, you know, eight days a week, he's done. I so saw... that kind of thing. Remember when he did "I'll Get You"? That was a big a big yeah. surprise. 
he I did saw struggle. a couple of comments uh, from people saying that, you know, he, he shouldn't do songs that John Lennon did. And, you know, the, when you think about it, it's like, oh, you know, sorry, folks, but John's not going to do those songs because he's not around anymore. And no so one, I don't no, think there's I don't think there's any reason why Paul shouldn't be able to do. No one gets upset songs. about him doing the song that Fats Domino did or uh, you know, yeah. something else. Yeah. It's kind of exactly. funny. Exactly. And you know something, just because John sang lead on these songs, Paul also had a hand in writing them. Yeah. So course. when you're dealing with something like Eight Days a Week, which was supposed to be a joint collaboration there. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. And I've heard people say A Hard <clears throat> Day's Night was John's song. And I think it largely was, but I also believe that that middle eight was probably Paul writing that mm -hmm. the part that he yeah. sings. So it's not yeah. like it's entirely John song. No. Yeah, but he, you know? he also he also did Strawberry Fields Forever one, you know. Um, and that right. was that was but a that tribute. was a tribute. Yeah. But no, I mean, anytime you do a song like that, you know, I mean, a song that John wrote or saw, it was primarily known for, it's also a tribute, and that's that's a nice mm -hmm. that's a nice thing. You know, so I'm I'm I have no problems with any of that. I, I don't. When I look at this set list, it reminds me a lot of the mid 2000s and a lot yeah. of what Paul was doing back then, because she mentioned in spite of all the danger, which he was doing back then. Mm -hmm. um, one that you didn't mention, Steve, which is to me, I'm going to be looking forward to this maybe more so than most of the songs is one that he did in Europe, but he never did here. And that's is... you won't you won't see me. Yeah. And he did that back in 2004. You know, there are certain songs that Paul did only in Europe and he didn't do here. Mm -hmm. Like She's Leaving Home was another one. And um, a few years ago, he did The Word live. Right. As yeah. well yeah. as uh, And Come and Get It, he did live in Europe, but mm -hmm. he didn't do it here. Another fun one was Temporary Secretary. Mm -hmm. that, oh, was, I... that was because it had, it, there were some cute visuals with that. So that was, and he, I think he had done that. He had well, done last that. year. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. So that yeah. was the first time I had seen that one. But that was, that was kind of fun too. So. Plus, I saw that he's doing "Can't Buy Me Love," which mm -hmm. he does on and off. It's never yeah. been part of his steady set list, I believe, since eighty nine ninety. So, um, mm. and he's also brought back Letting Go, which is the first time in a few years that he's done that. But I'm really happy that he's doing that because that's a great song live. Mm -hmm. So I always uh, love the fact that he did that. And we, I don't think he's done We Can Work It Out recently either. Uh, sure he has. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, See, he's God. done that one a lot, yeah. All right. But he also, I'm noticing he, he's doing Birthday. Mm -hmm. Which he did on the eighty nine ninety tour, but he only has done it at select special occasions. Yeah. Right. So um I know yeah, one. There's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, there's one at Radio City that I Yeah, remember. exactly. Um and he's still doing uh the three songs from new. So right. he's still supporting yeah. that album. But when I think about this show, Steve, it reminds me of when I saw Paul at Yankee Stadium a few years ago because it was the first show of the new tour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was looking forward to that so much because, you know, doing a radio show and also just being a fan and looking online and knowing what he's doing, you don't know what the set list is until you hear it. So sure. it's a big thrill for the first time. And when, when right. I saw him at Yankee Stadium and he did uh, the night before for yeah. the first time ever, mm -hmm. and yeah. it was also the first time he ever did 1985. Those yeah. are those are thrilling moments for me. So I guess it's mm -hmm. the same for you with a hard day's night and mm -hmm. uh, love me do. How was his voice on love me do? It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, he in fact he told a story after after the song. He said he was so he was uh, he talked about uh, George Martin having him sing um, love me do and he said you can hear how nervous I I sounded on the record. <laughs> he actually he actually told the crowd that which was kind of funny so mm -hmm. he's told that story yeah. a lot though yeah yes yes that's number but 732 he, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, all right, all right. Anyway. it's not as much as yesterday though okay okay or the we're gambling getting, lambs he, and he also told the jim <laughs> hey, uh sergeant sergeant pepper story well that's uh, that's kind of a standard part of the show right you right know. 
that's like every every show he does that because he does the 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 you know purple haze right salute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice? Did you look at the crowd and see what the general age was? Did you notice any you know teenagers well, the college, there or what? It was a it's a uh, Cal State Fresno, so it was a college. Basically, a, I mean there were there were older people there, but there were college people. In fact, there was. <laughs> It seems like every time I go to a McCartney concert, I get somebody standing in front of me the whole show. Mm-hmm. And we had we had two people standing directly in front of us, and it was a it was a, uh, a couple. And the female, let's just say, she was having a really good time because she was dancing almost the whole show. She was dancing away. I mean, it was. Um, and I hope she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> I tend but to find was, those people too. You know, they're oblivious yeah. to what's oh, going on. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they true. went out and got a drink in the middle of the show, so I knew they were oblivious. But it was it was funny. It was it was funny to to stand there and and watch them like that. Huh. Oh well. So I having mean, seen so many McCartney shows now, I mean, do you look at this? Because sometimes I look at from 2002 on mm-hmm. as being like a continuation of most of the same thing. I mean, yeah. yes, there are set list changes, but you've always got the heavyweights in there, which he plans mm-hmm. towards the end. You right. know you're going to get Hey Jude at the end. You know you're going to get Let It Be and Live and Let Die and Golden Slumbers carry that weight at the end. And, mm-hmm. you know, it seems to be, and yesterday is always towards the end. So sure. it's just a matter of those B-list songs that he interchanges here and there did you feel like there was enough change in this show to make it interesting for you or did you feel like this is just well another show just like all the others i didn't look at it that way at all and and, you know count me i i guess i I try not to go into these things you know with fandom over my head i really don't um but the the whole idea of hearing him do these songs, I don't know. Maybe I'm succumbing to the to the hype and all that, but I mean, the whole idea of hearing him do these, you know, the Beatles songs and 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 even the Wing songs and the Quarrymen song, for that matter. I mean, it's just it's just a great experience. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I, I you know, I, I I've read so many of the the press releases, you know, from the, the you know that the McCartney people send out, you know, and it's. You know, and they talk about uh, you know hearing you know the the experience and hearing the Beatles songs and everything, and it's and and it really is kind of like that. You know, even though even if you try to be somewhat impartial, which I'm you know which I'm trying to do <laughs> now, and and you know when I wrote about it, I mean it it, it you know it, it's it's I mean the songs are great. He sounds relatively good. I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, people are criticizing his voice. Um, he doesn't, I've heard a lot, the singers sound a lot worse than he does. He's pre- relative, he's sounding relatively good. He really is. You know, I mean, there's going to, I, there's going to be the critical people who say, oh, he doesn't sound like, you know, 1970. Well, of course he doesn't. I mean, he's, he's mm-hmm. you know, but I mean, I, I don't think he sounds that, you know, I don't think he sounds that bad. I've heard, you know, older people sound worse. I, I do remember, interestingly enough, um, Randy New- when I saw Randy Newman a few years ago, he sang a song, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Maybe one of you guys can remember it, where he talks about old rock and rollers that that won't quit. And I remember one night when I saw him, he mentioned Paul McCartney. But, I mean, you know, I mean, there are there are people that shouldn't be touring, and I don't, I don't necessarily think Paul isn't one of them. Um, I just hope he, you know, he retires at some point before, you know, he, he knows when to retire. That's, I guess that's the, the point, but I, no, I think the show, show was relatively good. I really do. I really do. I, I would not be critic that critical. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you guys, maybe you guys would, but I, I, I 
was pretty impressed. I mean, considering how long that show is, every you know, and and all that he goes through, and I mean, just getting you know, just getting there. Although I, I kind of, we kind of, uh, we were talking about this before too, and you know, we were saying I kind of don't think he stayed in Fresno. <laughs> uh, I really kind of doubt it. Well, I mean, he was in, he was he was in Santa Monica, you know, uh, sometime before that for the. Ron Howard interview that we talked about last week. So I kind of don't think he even he just flew into to Fresno for the show. But uh, you know, it was. I mean, still, it was it was fun. It was it was good. The weather was nice. It wasn't really hot. It could have been in the, in Central California. It really, really could have been hot. And it, thank God it was not. It was actually kind of cool. So mm. that was nice too. So. Do any of you guys want to comment about uh, the set list from what? what we've been talking about and what you've read and and um you know whether you're excited to see paul again you know if he if he comes closer to your area mm-hmm. i already have tickets for new jersey mm-hmm. so um how do you guys feel about this particular lineup of songs i think it's uh, it's uh, um, go ahead alan no i think steve's you know basically covered it um I, I was interested to see Hard Day's Night as the opener. I thought that was a nice mm-hmm. touch and uh, immediately went to YouTube to hear it. Uh, there's also a, a nice clip out there of um, McCartney and the bassist from Nirvana, Kirk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chris Novoselic. I'm not sure how you say his name even. Um mm-hmm. But uh, that that actually is a, is a pretty good clip. Um, usually it's Dave Grohl, but... Uh, Mm. Uh, nice seeing someone else out there with him. I, I kind of like actually some of his guest things that he does. You know, where he brings someone out, um, mm-hmm. um, and often these days it's a younger singer or you know younger singer guitarist. And uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, you know, so I, I don't know if he's going to. I mean, he's still announcing shows, but I'd kind of be surprised if he turned up in Portland, Maine. But you never know. <laughs> mm. I was yeah. going to say. I was going to say, if for anybody um, on YouTube, there is an about an hour of the Fresno show mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube. The sound quality is not fantastic; it's kind of bassy, but it's it's the, about the first hour or so. I don't I didn't notice how what uh, how uh, what song it cuts off on, but it goes pretty far into the show. I haven't uh, checked to see if there are any longer clips for any other shows or anybody got a complete show yet but uh so and the other thing i I didn't mention that i haven't written about was he did invite somebody up on stage and that was kind of cute because uh there was this couple and he even talked about it at one point during the show he pointed he pointed it out where the kid said my name is jude i'm named after the song and it's i'm jude's mother sign me and there were like five people crusading for this woman to get signed and he and they and they did and then they found out that jude wasn't named for exactly for hey jude it was named for some his real name was something else which was hilarious but anyway so but that that was it was cute it's cute to see that too that was kind of fun Hmm. so Mm -hmm. hey al al you were going to say something about Oh, just a, a well. For, well, for one thing, it, it looks like he's circling around Pittsburgh, but uh, not uh, not actually <laughs> not actually doing a show here. It looks like because he's doing he's doing Cleveland, he's doing Philadelphia, he's doing Washington. You know? he's, doing, he's doing. How close is Hershey to you? Uh, yeah. Hershey's uh, Hershey's on the other side of this. Pretty much the other side of the state. Oh, okay. Hershey's clo- Hershey's closer to Philadelphia. So really? it's, a, it's a big it's a big state. <laughs> so, oh, okay. so, you know, uh, anyway, well, yeah, it's possible he might add something here. But it is it's interesting to see him kind of recycle some of the songs that he did a decade or so ago and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, bring them back. Things like Here, There and Everywhere, which, uh, um, I, you know, I can remember that. You know, the performance of that on, you know, uh, the uh, the MTV Unplugged in 91 was, I mean, that was a real highlight. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I was wondering if, um, you know, voice wise, he can still he can still cut that particular song. But uh, there's a lot of songs where it it demands, uh, you know, quite a vocal range. Yeah. And, um, you know, that might be one of them. I mean, You Won't See Me is not easy to sing. No, it's not. Uh, mm. So, um, 
you know, there's there's a whole bunch of songs in his catalog. The ballads that require a range, like it's it's actually yeah. not that easy to sing something like "My Love," which he's not doing. Yeah, on his story, but uh, yeah. those are not that easy to do. No. And so when you when you talk about people in his age bracket who don't sound nearly as good as Paul does, and mm-hmm. they don't require the same range as Paul yeah. does. That's so true. and factor into it that he's doing two and a half hours plus. Yeah. So right. that's pretty remarkable to itself. But the mm-hmm. set list, Al. What what do you think of? It's, you just you just find it interesting that he's recycling. Yeah, I think it's interesting that he's you know that he is recycling now. Of course, what he tends to do is he tends to kind of shuffle things. Uh, I haven't seen the the uh, the the set list from the the show in where was it last night? Seattle. Uh, Seattle. I haven't seen a uh, uh, set list from that, so I don't know whether he shuffled anything in and out. But he does tend to do that, which is yeah, which is fine. No, so yeah. far, so so far, the only change was Helter Skelter added with uh, the guy from Nirvana. There have oh. been no set, nothing's been pulled out yet. Oh, okay. The, fir- the first two shows were the same. Ah, okay. So, mm. yeah, that's interesting. And by the way, it's also interesting, uh, after the announcement of the Cleveland show yesterday, the Rock Rock Hall of Fame sent out a press release about it, and it sounds like there's going to be something, I don't necessarily know that, uh, I mean, I'm guessing that Paul may try and do something special for that, uh, maybe bring bring an old song back for that one, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, with me, I always uh, have two different points of view. Yes. Whatever. T- <laughs> well, that's good to be well-rounded, you know. Right. Sure. And, uh, but uh, you know that I would really prefer for him to go deeper into his catalog and exactly. especially his solo catalog. Right. And that would excite me more. But um, I also know at the same time that uh, at this point, it's really tough to complain about anything mm-hmm. <laughs> that Paul does because he doesn't have to do anything, and the fact yeah. that he's even doing this. And still doing it very well and still giving you a lot of value for the money with two and a half to three hours uh, concert. What did he call this? It was, you know, Springsteen-esque. You know, Mm -hmm. he puts on these long shows. How many people his age can do that? You know, and walk around, play all the different instruments that he plays and sing, you know, requiring the range that it does. Mm -hmm. So uh, that alone is remarkable. And for a lot of people, and I understand this, it's. It's more and more a religious experience when you do this. And there's actually a, a, a promo that I saw that was uh, posted online where Paul is saying that he's finding more and more people are so, they're so moved by certain songs. It's so much a part of their lives growing up. You know, it's, it's part of their DNA. And mm-hmm. sometimes you don't even know how much these songs affect you when you, when you, you know, hear these songs live like this it takes you back to a different time or the fact that you've been living with these songs for 40 50 years it's sure. it's quite an emotional experience for a lot of people and he loves that mm-hmm. and uh, it means a lot to him to see this so there's that aspect of it too but um you know i also know i don't go to see paul mccarty because he was a beetle i go to see paul mccarty because he's one of the greatest artists of all time who started out in the beatles but right. since the, the world knows him most for being a Beatle and they're more familiar with that catalog, he mm-hmm. caters to that crowd. He's not going to give you a history lesson on Paul McCartney. He's there just to entertain the crowd and, and be a crowd pleaser, which mm-hmm. is what he's, what he's been doing essentially since, uh, you know, the, the Back in the U.S. 2002 tour on. Mm-hmm. But um, moving on, there was a bit of news which hasn't been made official yet about uh, the people behind the Coachella Festival who are putting together a huge concert that would involve six iconic acts who revolutionize music. Steve, why don't you tell the folks about it? Okay, well, the, the rumors, and usually when, the, uh, when this gets reported like this, it's more than a rumor, but uh, apparently Coachella is going to have a three-day festival that's going to have McCartney, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, The Who, and Roger Waters. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be in October in Indio, California, which is in Southern California. And the first thing I saw, I think, from somebody 
said they said i can imagine how expensive the tickets are going to be and yeah. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah i mean i can yeah i can only can only guess uh but uh yeah it's going to be crazy but uh ray kelly from mass live said uh it'll be dylan and the stones the first night young and mccartney the second night and the who and roger waters at the end the last mm-hmm. night and uh, each, I, according to this according to Ray Kelly, each act will probably will be reportedly paid seven million dollars. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Ugh. And from from what I understand, it's supposed to be their full sets. Really? So you know, with uh, with their have, full production stages. So I have not gone to a a, a festival. To see these, any of these guys, to see McCartney, for example, and I don't, boy, that's going to be a crazy, crazy situation. I mean, I, I went to one uh, outdoor festival. I went to one hardly strictly bluegrass, which, if people people in the Bay Area that are listening will know what I'm talking about, it's a free bluegrass festival at Golden Gate Park, and that was crazy enough. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I can only imagine what this is going to be like. God. Yeah, of course, this won't be, you know, this isn't going to be actually like a festival. You know, it just happens that it's going to be promoted by the, the people that do Coachella. It's going to be probably, I assume, more like a structured, you know, since it's only the two acts on each night, you know, well, it'd be would, really, would, really more like a concert. Well, I would think, yeah, yeah, I guess I would guess you'd have to pay for, I don't know. I mean, I... I I mean, you pay. You normally, when you go to these outdoor festivals like this, you pay for the whole the whole nine yards. You know, I mean, you pay for the for the whole night. You don't pay for individual shows. So right, but you're getting eight million different groups in several different locations and all that. Uh, this sounds like it's just going to be in one location, and there's just going to be the two acts each night. Well, I, I mean, if if there wasn't more than two acts, who would go to see any of the others? <laughs> that's the well, that's the big the, yeah. Uh, that's the big. It's question. actually going to be it's going to be at the Empire Polo Field mm-hmm. in Indio, mm-hmm. California. Okay. And I'd also have to imagine that this has got to be released on DVD. Something from this, mm-hmm. they got to make something more out of this. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you've got these powerhouse acts together. And so many of them have never been on the same bill together. McCartney and Dylan have never been on the same bill together, although they're on mm-hmm. different nights. You know, mm-hmm. so um, I think that's pretty exciting, you know. Although you have to wonder, wh- which acts do you pick? I mean, why not Eric Clapton, you know, for that matter? Or, um, you know, it would be nice if Ringo was a part of it, <laughs> since he's always touring. Mm. But, uh, you know, you have to get all the all-star band members. And I think, at you know, at that, at that uh, point, uh, their tour would have ended. So. Yeah, Ringo, Ringo's tour, Ringo's only touring through July, so. Yeah. But uh, it's a great killer lineup right there. Also in the news, there's word that the Traveling Wilburys are making a comeback of sorts. They're going to be available for streaming very soon. And also their catalog, all both albums. Uh, are going to be re-released. So, Steve, you were reporting about that. Yes. Um, yeah, it came out yesterday, which would be April uh, 18th, that uh, Concord has taken over the Wilburys uh, from Rhino, and they're going to reissue the, the box set, the collection, and, and the Wilburys music is going to go streaming, which... Um, is an interesting is is good, um, and they're gonna like I said they're gonna re-release uh, everything, uh, the uh, two CD one D- DVD box set, the uh, um, you know they're gonna they're gonna put everything out again, uh, and then a vinyl box, and there's gonna be high res downloads for the first time, so mm-hmm. that's gonna be for people who love that, and it and it all comes from the uh, licensing agreement that uh with the Harrison music that uh uh was uh, announced in January so there we go all right is there anything new no. on it okay. no according to that that's the only the only befuddlement the I saw the press release I had to go hunting for it did not say anything new at all mm-hmm. it's all 
they're reissuing the collection that Rhino put out, and so no, nothing new. Interesting. Sure, not it would be that, nice not that there is that like, much. I don't think there is. But yeah, you never know. I mean, basically, there are a couple of uncollected remixes and B sides, and you know mm. that kind of thing. A few different versions of Handle with Care or something. But I mean, mm. the basic material we've heard. So interesting. It would be. It would be nice if somebody had that Palomino show. Mm. That would be worth. That would be great. That would mm. be. That would be fun. So, but it's it's actually nice that that it, they'll 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 be available for streaming, because you know when you consider that all you ever hear on you know terrestrial radio is you know usually handled with care, maybe end of the line. Mm. Uh, you know there would be so much other material from certainly the first album and even the second one, even though the second one was you know a much weaker album. Uh, that people, you know, younger people particularly, might uh, might discover. Yeah, well, both albums had a lot of great material on there. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. So, so this follows the footsteps of the Beatles' core catalog being available for streaming, mm-hmm. which happened around Christmas time, and the Beatles' anthology being available for streaming, the three right. double CDs, mm-hmm. uh, and now the Traveling Wilbury. So, good thing right there. You know, there's one thing to say about the Beatles anthology streaming. Um, apparently, I haven't compared it myself, but I know a lot of people who um, have done, and they say that the anthology has been remastered and sounds immensely better than the CDs, even on really? stream. Yeah. Ooh. Really? Mm. Mm. Might be worth looking into. I think mm. we will. Interesting. <laughs> All right, so we also need to talk a little bit about this past weekend and what happened at the Hilton Westchester in Rybrook, New York, that being the fest for Beatle fans. Al and I were both there. We did a panel discussion with uh, WFUV's Darren DeVivo and our own Tom Franjo, and both Darren and Tom have been frequent co-hosts here on the show. And we talked about the Pure McCartney release, and we also talked about the McCartney tour. So that was a lot of fun, and I think mm-hmm. that really went well. Um, mm-hmm. Al was the moderator. How did you feel that went? Oh, I thought it went. Uh, I thought it went very well. Uh, you know, I was a little. I was a little apprehensive that uh, that we, you know, we're going to have to uh, start scrambling for other other topics. But uh, uh, but <laughs> was, certainly Tom is never at a loss for words, and uh, had a lot to say about Pure McCartney. And uh, uh, and Darren had a you know somewhat contrary opinion of a, a more from a more kind of establishment you know uh, as he said caveman uh, point of view. Can, and, you, can, uh, can you give a rundown, just a little rundown of what everybody said? You know, I asked the question like I did here on the show. Mm-hmm. If you if you were to introduce Paul's music, his solo music, to someone who is just learning about it what would you start out with? And I remember you, Steve, saying Band on the Run. Mm -hmm. And I asked Al the question. He said Band on the Run. But I I made the case that when you have something like this and you're mixing the hits with album cuts and it's spanning his entire career, you get a good overview of what he's done. And Mm -hmm. I'd much rather introduce someone to something like this that spans all the decades instead of just one year of his career, you know, or one particular time, time period. And uh, Tom had said that he's all for a compilation, just not this compilation, (laughs) (laughs) because, you know, he was extremely critical. Um, He was saying things like um, it's a very unbalanced uh, Mm -hmm. part of his career because you got eight songs from Flaming Pie. And then you've got, I think it's two songs from Tug of War, you know, something like that. Um, Of course, we all brought up the fact that there's nothing from Flowers in the Dirt in there. Right. I think that, that Darren, for the most part, was very positive about it. And like you said, the whole caveman thing, uh, right. Darren, Darren is a lot like many of us who still want the physical product. Mm-hmm. We don't buy the digital stuff. We don't buy MP3s. We, don't, we may not stream. There's mm-hmm. a, lot of people, a lot of people who listen to my show that don't do that, that still want physical product. Right. And for those people, 
you know, and it's it's wrong to assume that everybody's on Spotify. Yeah, you know, you know, like like I was saying to you, I have listeners of my own with my live show that listen to me on something called a radio frequency. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, I've heard of that. It's not being streamed for some people. Yeah. I have some people that don't have a computer yeah. that refuse to buy a computer, mm-hmm. you know, and to assume that everybody is, is completely digital these days is, is a farce to say yeah. the least. Sure. But, you know, obviously that's much more skewed to younger people who are into that sharing music on Spotify and all. And I also yeah. do believe that there are people who like to be programmed to. You know, it's not like we have mm-hmm. to discover the music ourselves. And it's yeah. true. You can pick all these songs that were on the four CD set and you can put them all together yourself. You can listen mm-hmm. to them on YouTube or you can create a playlist if you want to. But it's nice to know that this is something that Paul and his team put together, even if there's, there's no way you can look at it as being perfect because we all have different tastes. Mm-hmm. You know, and we all brought up that point of view that we'd all come up with our own playlist and all be different from each other. Exactly. You know, yeah. so just the idea that periodically this thing has to be done. And it's it to me anyway, I think it's a far better way of introducing an artist catalog than specifically one album. And I recall, Steve, and I wanted to to, to bounce <laughs> off of you on this okay. on, on our last show, because you said that when you do something like that, you're taking the music out of context, which I, I completely mm. don't even understand because mm. the, the strength of a song is if it stands on its own. Yeah. It doesn't have to be tied to a specific album and that's it. You know, and when I do my radio show and I'm bouncing around all the different decades and I'm mixing the group and the solo, you mm. hear a consistency there where it all makes sense. And I've actually had a lot of my listeners tell me that, where the, the music flows. You know, when you're going from Rubber Soul to Flowers in the Dirt to Cloud Nine to Imagine, you know, it does make sense when you mix it all together. And in well, this case, in this case, I think that the, the Beatles and the solo Beatle catalog is like that, where you can, it's just like any radio show where it's all mixed. I wouldn't say, hey, uh, I wouldn't listen to Sgt. Pepper unless with a little help my friends follows, you know, it's... It, the songs have to be strong on their own. I think it depends on on the songs, you know. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I I I did what Paul McCartney said. As I was driving down to Fresno, I had Pure McCartney on my, you know, playing, and I didn't listen to it on the way back. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> it, it it just it didn't it just didn't do much. I mean, uh, Tom's. Uh, description of uneven is 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 really you know pretty good i mean it really is it's uh more specifically he he called it the mess Mm. (laughs) Uh, yeah i mean he's not the only one who said that i mean i've seen other people say that too and yeah it's not it it just you know well uh, i'm not saying it's i'm not saying it's perfect but it might be interesting for us maybe in some show to put together our own list you know, and get feedback from our listeners. And then you might be surprised. Some people would mm-hmm. say, how can you possibly consider that song? You know, mm-hmm. you know, you got you to step back and look at everything collectively as a whole. I don't think this is a perfect collection by any means, but there are a lot of benefits to it. And I do love the fact that he is really recognizing his later stuff. Mm-hmm. When you think about the fact that Wingspan, the collection, only went up to 1984... And all the best actually only went up to eighty-seven. You need music to represent all the years no, after that. I'm not going to. No. I'm not going to argue that point. I I do still hold to what I said about taking songs out of context. I think you know greatest hits albums that take things out of context, you know, are with individual songs, don't really give the full flavor of of each of the songs. By the way, I did see a comment. Uh, I believe it was on YouTube from somebody who backed what you said about the compilations. So, yes, I saw that too. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're <laughs> to welcome. that, to that uh, listener. But, but uh, do, do any of you want to chime in on this? You know, do you feel that music has to be connected to the way it was originally conceived on albums, or are they? Yeah, should they? yeah the out of context thing I have a problem with because again, like you were saying, Ken, those songs really stand alone unless it's part of a, you know, uh, of a concept. 
you know, mm. if it's right, you know, if it's if it's just a song and it's not part of a a concept, although for you know, for yeah. instance, there 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 are tracks from say Tommy, sure, that that mm-hmm. certainly uh, can stand uh, stand alone on their own. And that's and they're out of context. Well, and people the, do people do concerts of opera arias taken out of yeah. the opera. You know, it's it's well, yeah. I mean, let me let me just you know, I wasn't saying you know don't take songs out of context. Don't you know? I'm saying greatest hits albums as a uh, which basically this kind of is. You know, don't give the full flavor of the original song, and that's I think that. You know, in trying to get people to turn the, turn them on to this music, I think you lose a little bit of that. You know, I mean, some of those songs on Pure McCartney, you know, are just are just kind of stale without the album that they kind they came from. You know, uh, it's just I mean, I, I I don't I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, really. <laughs> and, and not um, only that, but there's a lot of songs that were singles that were strictly singles. That aren't even yeah. connected to albums, right? I mean, where do you place those? Do you have to put them somewhere? Well, mm-hmm. I, it, 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 I mean, we're talking about uh, you know d- different songs for different, you know. I mean, we're not talking about uh, not comparing all songs all the way down the road. I mean, for example, um, "Warm and Beautiful" really just doesn't doesn't. I know you. I think you were talking about that, uh, Ken, and you were you were really raving about it. I mean, I. And, you know, in the context of Pierre McCartney, it just didn't, just didn't make it. You know, um, why? Dear why? Boy, you, why? How? The same yeah. why? It just didn't. It just, it just kind of felt flat after Jet and Heart of the Country. I mean, to me, well, I mean, you know, uh, and the and, whole I- the whole idea of McCartney is that he has variety in his music. Yeah, right. you know, so you can I've go had, from Jet to to Warm and Beautiful, and it shouldn't even be a problem. No, mm-hmm. well. I mean, I'll, I'll go back to what I said before that, you know, there there were not a, a lot, there's not really a lot of <laughs> nice, disco- you know, discoverable songs in Pure McCartney uh, as I as I saw it. You know, Discover- I mean, Dis- discoverable as as in you listen to him and you go, oh wow, what a great song it is! I'd never heard that before. Um, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, uh, I, I could, I could completely disagree. Yeah, I know, yeah. I, I know you could. I know you could. But I, I but that's <laughs> just, just the way. Just you know, I mean, I think that's one of the problems with Pierre McCartney. I mean, if those kind of songs are there, then it works. I mean, it it hinges together better. That's the problem. That's what we've all. That's what. Everybody, I mean, I'm not the only one that's, that said there's problems with this thing. You've even said there are problems with this thing. Yeah, and, I didn't say it was perfect. Sure. And that's yeah. that's what the big problem is here. That's, you know. Uh, well, I'd, I'd love to see a list from you of what you think would be the perfect compilation from Paul. Hmm. Why don't you put together a four CD list and then we'll all, we'll all comment about it. <laughs> I have a feeling that we'll we'll all have different opinions on it. Oh, of course. But that's that's just the way that it is. I mean, to me, to put Bip Bop in there, please. I mean, I love most of Paul's solo career, solo recordings, all in varying degrees. There are certain songs that I look upon as being really masterpieces that are completely undiscovered or rarely got airplay. I mean, Paul Paul stopped getting decent airplay in radio from, say... Well, maybe Flowers in the Dirty got some airplay from, from, say, the 90s on. I mean, yeah. you take a look at all the stuff, the great stuff on Flaming Pie from The World Tonight, which, you know, that should have been a big hit. If it really got a lot of airplay, I think it would have been. Some Days is such a great yeah. song. The fact that he put Calico Skies on here and Souvenir and, you know... I don't know if Great Day is, is really, you know, one of the best songs of his soul. I w- probably wouldn't have put that on there. But he puts Jenny Wren on there from Chaos and Creation. That song is brilliant. You know, I love the fact that he puts something like that on there. And English I'm not going to say every, I'm not saying every single, un, you know, album cut from Paul is brilliant and a masterpiece. Jenny Wren is. Jenny Wren deserves to be recognized. You know, a song like that. How about English Tea? English tea is good. I wouldn't say it's one of the best. I would say definitely from that album, Jenny Wren deserves it. 
a fine line only because it was the single. I do like the song. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Not going to argue there. You know, I love This Never Happened Before. I, uh, too Much mm-hmm. Rain. Too Much Rain is a great it's, song. It is a wonderful song. And and not only that, for people who are critical of Paul for his lyrics, listen to the lyrics of that song. He actually mm-hmm. said that one was, was inspired by the song Smile by Charlie Chaplin. And mm-hmm. if you listen to the lyrics, it's like you do the opposite of when you feel pain. You, you know, you smile through the pain kind of thing. Um, so that's really, you know, a song of hope in a way. And he's really great at doing that. You know, and the fact that he puts early days on there from new. I mean, that's a, that's a song you should definitely be aware of. You know, oh, if yeah. you want to know some of, of Paul's great stuff, you know, I, I'm I'm really excited about this, but it's certainly not perfect. I have so many favorites of mine that didn't make this list. And that's not counting the songs that were big hits that didn't make it that really should have, like Helen Wheels or, or um, you know, Take It Away should have been on there. Or Ballroom Dancing, which wasn't a hit, but that should have been. That's to me, that's one of the greatest songs that was never a single from Paul's right. career. So, you know, there's a lot of good to be said about this compilation. And so, like I said, if, if you put together your own list, I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with it. I, I just, uh, I mean, I think it could have been a whole lot stronger. A whole lot stronger. Okay, put together your list, and we'll debate it. <laughs> anyway, ah. getting, getting back to the, uh, to the fest. The fest. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Ken saw a lot more of it than I did because I was busy in the uh, in the author's room, the act naturally stage, as they call it, uh, mm-hmm. with uh, you know moderating panels and doing Q and A's and things like that. So I saw actually very little of the action in the ballroom. Uh, Ken saw a lot more of it, didn't you? Yeah, well, <laughs> the the ballroom was mainly a lot of performances and interviews. Right, which is, exactly. That's that's my favorite thing going to the fest. That and mm-hmm. talking to people who follow both my shows you know i love getting feedback from them and for for a lot of people it's the only opportunity they get to meet me sometimes so but in the ballroom you had great performances from people like well jeff slate with his band Mm -hmm. birds of paradox and i just love to see apart from the fact that you know jeff is a really good songwriter i love his music and he's got all these people that worked with john or paul you know in his band adam epolito and gary van sog from elephant's memory and steve Mm -hmm. holly from Wings is in the band, and a great, really great guitar player, Jimmy Mack, is in the group. Yeah. You know, they put together uh, a few of his original songs, mixing that with songs that are connected to the Beatles, like, for example, uh, doing Come Together, since that's what John performed at One to One with mm-hmm. Elephant's Memory. Um, Adam Ippolito did more of a, it was described, Leon Russell ish version of Lady Madonna. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Steve Holly. Steve Holly, who up until recently, I, I hardly ever saw him sing live before. He's been doing It Don't Come Easy. Really? Live and singing that, yeah. Wow. He's also been doing I Saw Her Standing There. I love to, 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 to hear him sing and drum at the same time. And, um, you know, it's a really killer band, and they have a brand new CD out, which, by the way, has the two guys from Elephant's Memory, has Steve Holly and Lawrence Juber playing, too. So kind of like the Birds of Paradox CD that came out before. It's very similar. Plus, by the way, Carlos Alomar and Earl Slick, they're both on the CD. Mm-hmm. So it's called Secret Poetry, but they were great. And then there's the British Invasion artist, Billy J. Kramer. I never get tired of seeing Billy J. Kramer. You know, mm-hmm. when you see somebody, all these British Invasion artists mean more to me now than they ever have before. Sure. And they're all like in their, you know, early to mid 70s. Let's mm-hmm. face it, folks. And yeah. Billy, Billy still does concerts and his voice sounds great. And he mixes his classic tunes from the 60s and the Lennon-McCartney stuff with his newer material. And for me, it's, it's not only great to see him lie, but to see that he's still so excited doing this. Yes. He was, he was born to be a performer, and he does that song to Liverpool with Love, which is on his uh, most recent CD called I Won the Fight. Mm-hmm. A lot of the songs are very autobiographical. And he goes out into the audience and gets people to sing along with the chorus. You know, mm-hmm. he's beating and greeting the fans. He's really into it. So that's a big thrill for me. I've known Billy for, for a long time, since the 80s. And by the way, his new book, I agree with you, Steve, Do You Want to Know a Secret, is really great. Mm. Uh, I would definitely recommend, you know, getting that. And then there's Mike Pender, who came out and did, uh, you know, Serge's material. He still sounds great. 
it's a big thrill for me to see the band Liverpool because not only are they a great Beatles tribute band, but I get more impressed, as I've said before here on the show, when they back up other people. Sure. And, um, you know, backing up Mike Pender. Billy J came out with his own band, and he's got uh, Liberty DeVito on drums, a whole bunch of really good musicians. But Liverpool backed up Mike Pender. But for me, and I don't want to take away anything from the artist I just mentioned, it was mm-hmm. extremely emotional. And the entire weekend was worth it just to see Peter Asher with Jack Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, I'm really I, sorry I missed that. There was no way I couldn't miss because they were there both days. It was parts one and two. Right. And if you've never seen Peter Asher before, if he's ever performing in your area, you should see him because he does sort of a mix of a storyteller show mixed with his own music, which he sings with a backup band. Only this time he's combining his history with Peter and Gordon and mm-hmm. what followed with the history of Chad and Jeremy. So not mm-hmm. only do you get the performances of Peter doing Peter and Gordon songs, you get Chad and Jeremy doing their songs. And, you know, you close your eyes and they sound exactly as they did in the 60s. They have yeah. the same voices. And I can't believe, I mean, we're talking about seeing McCartney live and how emotional it is for some people. I was actually welling up over hearing a summer song. And mm-hmm. the summer song is one of those songs I could hear every day for the rest of my life and never get tired of. And mm-hmm. here are the two guys singing it. Uh, 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 also, you know, Willow Weep for Me and Yesterday's Gone and those great songs. And they're playing clips of, you know, you'd love this, Steve, the, the Patty Duke stuff and mm-hmm. Dick Van Dyke show and being on the Batman show and, mm-hmm. um, and Peter showing a lot of photos of him from the Gordon days and being on television on, on Hullabaloo. Where mm-hmm. he had to sing part of a medley with Diana Ross. They they were doing um, eight days a week. I don't know if you remember that that episode, guys. Oh yeah. But um, <laughs> you know, starting with Diana Ross, and the Supremes singing it, or was it was it Peter and Gordon? I'm trying to remember. But it was also Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs were in there, and you know, it it is great to see all this stuff. And you also got to actually be a, more aware that there was more of a relationship between Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy. You might have think mm-hmm. they'd been two completely opposite careers, but there were times when Jeremy visited Peter at Peter's home at the time when Paul was sharing it, you know, mm-hmm. and you see a lot of photos through the years that are just wonderful. So it's a great retrospective. It's a combination of the music and, and seeing all these photos and videos, and it's a great presentation, and Peter Escher is a wonderful speaker to begin with and sure. very funny and they're bouncing off each other and once in a while they'll they'll trade insults you know there was a moment in the first show on on um on saturday where when it started out uh peter was having trouble hearing his guitar playing and then later on he was talking into the microphone and you couldn't hear him talk so he's he's trying to get all this stuff fixed and asking the engineer to work on this and then jeremy turns him and says you know for someone who's a producer you're pretty inept <laughs> <laughs> you know, <and> I, <laughs> but you know they can get away with it they're friends so i just sure. love that kind of banter back and forth and and one thing that always chokes me up and i've seen this every time i've seen peter perform oh, is yeah, that I um think. they mm-hmm. do um when they perform buddy holly's true love ways yeah, which I, right. yeah. I always love the peter and gordon version and they show a clip of peter singing it i mean uh, of gordon oh, singing gordon. it live yeah. right and um, and then Peter sings to it live. Yeah. And I'm I'm really touched by that because that's Peter's way of keeping Gordon out there, you know, right. and keeping yeah. him part of us. And so I, it was emotionally draining. You know, um, mm-hmm. the, my only regret is, and I've said this time and time again, there's so many things that go on simultaneously at the fest that you can't mm-hmm. do everything you want to. And I yeah. would have loved to have spent time with all the panels that there were. And there were all the authors who had been on this show, like Kid O'Toole and Jude Kessler, yeah. Anthony Robustelli. I, I barely got to spend time with any of them because I was so locked into the ballroom. You know? I love yeah. that. Yeah, we had one on Saturday on Saturday night. We had one with, uh, as I called them, the newer authors. Uh-huh. Uh, P- uh, Piers Hemmingson, who, was, who did this book on the on the Beatles in Canada, and John Cruth, who did the uh, the the book on Rubber Soul, and uh, Michael Starr, who did the uh, the Ringo uh, biography, and uh, Greg Sterlase, who did that 
book on Beatles books and uh, Anthony Robostelli sat in and so did Ken Womack. Mm. So that was, that was really, that was for me, at least that was a real highlight of the weekend. Mm. I wish everything would be videotaped yeah. or put onto DVD yeah. and just sold as a package for all the stuff that you missed. Mm-hmm. So uh, they should stream yeah, it. You could do it. Yeah, a lot of it's a lot of places that have conferences, actual you know, and, and speeches and various events actually do stream them now. Mm. Right. So, but can you stream all the events going on at the same well, time? Well, it would be hard. I mean, you, you know, um, you could stream selectively, or you could have you know different channels. Well, I know for some years there was there was a stream, a live stream of what went on in the ballroom. But uh, Warren Melnick, the fellow who basically handled all of that, uh, retired from festing a couple of years ago. Mm. And since then, there's been no stream. And Mm. there's never been a stream of any of the activities in the other rooms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would be uh, logistically, it would be tough. Yeah. And also, I just want to say, and I don't want this to sound really depressing here, but it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been losing a lot of very dear people Boy, at an alarming that, rate. That's the truth, yeah. And it's happening more and more. So when I'm, if I can go to a place where I can see Peter Asher, Chad and Jeremy, mm-hmm. yep. and Mike Pender, uh, you better believe I'm going to be there. I, I just, you know, treasure these people and I hold on to them for a while we have them. And, mm-hmm. you know, not only am I happy that they're still with us, but the fact that they're even performing. People forget the fact that Chad, Chad lives in Idaho. Jeremy mm-hmm. lives in England. You know? yeah. it's, it's not all that convenient for the two of them to do a tour together. So sure. uh, just that alone. I've seen Chad and Jeremy many times in recent years, and I love every minute because they, they sound so great still together. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're like untouched by time. So, yeah. uh, and I was so thrilled when Peter and Gordon reunited when they did. So yeah. uh, I'm just so grateful that, uh, you know, Mark Lapito's put this show together as he's done all of his shows. And mm-hmm. I got to tell you one other thing that was a big thrill for me, and that was seeing they had all of the programs. <laughs> yes. The Did you see that? From the yeah. first one all the way, it's, it's 42 all years. Of, and, all the way to, uh, to 20, uh, I think 2014, I guess, the, the New York uh, show. I, think, I yeah. think it's the last one on there. But uh, yeah, that's, I, I would love to have a poster of that. Yeah, that would be nice. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've been to at least one of every, you know, I think except I think there was one year when I didn't get to the New York show and uh, because of health problems or something. But um, I've been otherwise I've been at, to at least one Beatle Fest or Fest every year. Mm. That's remarkable. I, I wonder yeah. how many people have been to the fest every year since it started. I, you know, that's got to be tough. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be real tough because I know a lot of the people that were regulars back in the seventies. A lot of them, you know, a lot of them are gone now. Right. Um, and a lot of them, you know, they 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 basically stopped coming for various and various and sundry reasons. So I don't know, don't know of anybody that, uh, you know, that has made the entire circuit, you know, from, you know, from 1974. Uh-huh. <laughs> how, cra- how crowded was it over the three days? Saturday was, uh, uh, there was a good turnout on Saturday. Uh, Sunday was okay. Not spectacular, but it was okay. And Friday was Friday. Friday's never, you know, all right. that, uh, all that crowded. But uh, but there was a very good turnout on Saturday. Mm. Mm. Oh, it was packed on Saturday. Yes. But uh, the only thing r- really horrible was the parking there. There were no parking spaces, and you had to park way across the street. <laughs> yeah. And um, and they had a couple of weddings going on at the same time. Right. At that hotel, which didn't help matters any. Yeah. But um, no, it's a tremendous show. I, I love going to meet all these guests. And mm-hmm. anyone that's had any contact with the Beatles, you know, to see just to see the people that I saw in that ballroom alone, yeah. it was worth it. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's just I'm just so grateful that I got to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember I saw the first year that Chad and Jeremy uh, played the Chicago Fest. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, I was able to get into the ballroom to see that. And that was that was fabulous because, I mean, I I wasn't uh, to be honest, my my expectations weren't that high, but they like you say, they sounded exactly the way they did in 1964. It really is remarkable when you think about it. I mean, there are certain people who it's so ingrained in them what to sing. I mean, you could take Simon and Garfunkel and Mm -hmm. they may not perform in 25 years. They get together and they'll sound the same. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's just the way it is. You know, there's so there's there's so much in each other's skin. And Mm. uh, it's uh, I'm sure the Everly Brothers were the same way. And yeah, the Beach Boys and well, the Beatles. (laughs) <laughs> sure. So, yeah, that's part of the magic of it all. All right. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Okay. Well, if any of our listeners would like to comment on this show, or even if you want to pass along some ideas for us, what you can do is write to us at our email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page at things we said today. Our own Twitter account, and I never remember the address for that. So, Steve? Things we said fab. Okay. If uh, anyone would like to get in touch with Steve, you, they can do so how? Beatlesexaminer at gmail.com or on Facebook on my personal page. And I also have a group, uh, Beatles News and Commentary. Mm-hmm. And Al, how about you? Uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, uh, Twitter, at A-S-U-S-S-49, or via www.beetlefan.com or www.paradingpress.com. And Alan? Oh, you? probably just on Facebook under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my alter ego. Easiest way to get me. Okay. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have my own Facebook page, that under the name Ken Michaels. And also there's my website, which you should also check out, kenmichaelsradio.com. All right. And I just want to make sure, because I always forget things to say here on the show, and I end up regretting it later. A big thank you to everyone who came out to the fest who said hello to us. Mm -hmm. And those who attended the panel, it was great to have you there. We really appreciate it. So, uh, on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Al Suspin, and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>